Hey guys, welcome back to Problem Up Cam, and we're carrying on with Unit 4, looking at a HL only topic in this video, which is hybridization. Don't worry for all the SL people, though, there are still videos left in this unit, so just hang in there. Just to get started, then, using what we did in the formal charge video, which of these two structures is the preferred structure? Take a little moment and have a bit of practice. Okay, so when we compare them both, we get a formal charge change of zero for the molecule on the left and plus three for the molecule on the right, which means that the molecule on the right is of course going to be the preferred structure as whichever one has delta FC closest to zero is the preferred structure. Okay, on with hybridization then. So firstly, let's think about atomic orbitals. So, so far we've characterized the S and the P orbitals, and we have the S orbitals as this kind of spherical shape. And then we also have the P orbitals, which have that kind of dumbbell shape. So we have one S orbital in every energy level, and we have three P orbitals that would exist along the X, Y, and Z axes. And all of these, of course, hold two electrons each. So when a bond is formed, these orbitals overlap. However, this overlap doesn't maintain the same structure of the orbitals as before the bonding. They interact and indeed they form a new orbital and we call this a molecular orbital. So for a single bond or a sigma bond, we have the end on overlap of these orbitals. And that means the overlap happens in between the two nuclei, which here would be in the center of the two axes that I've drawn. So this interatomic overlap then forms a new area of electron density between the two nuclei. And that's what we call a molecular orbital and specifically when it's along the interatomic axis, i.e. between the two nuclei, this is a sigma molecular orbital. Okay, so, so far so good, right? Well, not so much. If we think about how the four basic S and P orbitals would actually overlap with the atomic orbital structure, we'd end up with something that looks like this. And if we then draw out the Lewis structure of CH4, we would expect four single bonds that are equally spaced at 109.5 degrees. That doesn't look like it really fits in the framework that we have here. So what's going on? Why aren't the bonds forming like the orbitals? Now what's happening here is the S and P orbitals are combining together so we can take any number of the 1s and the 3p orbitals and when they combine we end up with these uniform hybridized orbitals. And this is important because if we want to predictably draw Lewis structures and compare them to reality we would expect all of the orbitals to be equal and repel equally. So this needs to happen for us to be able to predict Lewis structures reliably. So if we look at the most simple example first, sp3 hybridization, which actually occurs in CH4, here we have four total electrons that are across the 2s and the 2p orbitals. So what happens is the 3p orbitals and the 1s orbital all combine. And when they combine, the p orbitals drop slightly in energy and the s orbitals go up a bit in energy and this allows all four of the orbitals to have equal energy and that's great if they all have equal energy then these four electrons are going to be spaced evenly and then be available to form single bonds with the hydrogens in the example of CH4 and not only do the energy of these orbitals become the same also the shape becomes uniform. So we did have a spherical and three dumbbell shaped orbitals and end up we end up with these four kind of baseball bat exclamation mark 
looking kind of orbitals, lopsided dumbbells. And because they all have the same shape, they can all repel each other equally and then be arranged tetrahedrally. The shaded blue component is the bonding component of these orbitals with the nuclei existing right in the center of the crossover before the very small lobe on the other side. So this helps us easily explain that 109.5 degree bond angle and also it helps us explain lone pairs. If we think of lone pairs as a hybridized orbital as well then they also help us reveal the shape of the Lewis structures. So we also consider those to be hybridized. So both CH4 and NH3 are sp3 hybridized. So how else could we organize this? Well we could have sp2 hybridization. So in this situation we take the 1s orbital and we take two of the p orbitals but we leave one unhybridized p orbital. So what we end up with is we end up with three orbitals that have equal energy and one p orbital that remains at its original energy. So let's have a look at how this works out with something like oxygen O2. So of course here we have six electrons so we would fill up on the left hand side two in the 2s, two in one of the p orbitals and then one in each of the others leaving only two electrons for bonding. Now if we fill up the hybridized we get the same layout however because we have the hybridized orbitals remember hybridized orbitals can act as lone pairs. So now we get three hybridized orbitals that are going to repel each other okay they are our sp2 orbitals and we're going to get one of those which has one electron which can form a covalent bond and the two other sp2 orbitals are our lone pairs and then above and below the plane we have our p orbital in the same shape as it was before and this helps us explain how we get a 120 angle when we have this kind of configuration um, before we account for the lone pairs because it's arranged in a trigonal planar configuration around the atom. So we've addressed two types of hybridization sp3 and sp2 and so now the logical conclusion is our third type of hybridization which is sp hybridization. So as we might expect with sp hybridization we're going to end up with two orbitals of equal energy and two of the p orbitals are going to remain as they were before the hybridization. So the s orbital and one of the p orbitals will come together and form our sp hybridized orbitals same shape as before. So nitrogen has this kind of configuration where if we look at the s and the p orbitals we're going to have only two so we've got one which is going to form a covalent bond and we have one lone pair behind and this is where we get that linear shape we would expect around the nitrogen atom accounting for the lone pair because we have the p orbital above and below the plane and also in front and behind the plane of course those p orbitals not involved in forming inter-nuclear single covalent bonds. So they're arranged at 180 degrees from each other which gives us a linear configuration for sp hybridized atoms. Now we've covered that, let's try a question. First question, which orbitals combine to form sp3 hybridized orbitals? Pause the video and have a go. Pop them up. Clues in the name here. We have three p orbitals and one s orbital. That's the px, py, and pz orbital, and the s orbital. Next question What basic geometry would we expect from the sp3 hybridization? Pause the video and have a go. Pop them up. Four equal energy orbitals are of course going to cause a basic geometry of 
tetrahedral. So taken together, hybridization and molecular orbitals change our conception of sigma bonds and they allow us to understand why we see these changes in the geometry that line up with the Lewis structures that we've been drawing. However, they are obviously, however, they are still defined as an interatomic overlap. However, the one thing we haven't addressed yet is double bonds and how they form in this system of internuclear overlap. So in sp2 and sp hybridization, you'll remember that we have unhybridized p orbitals that were also still present in the molecule. We can draw those kind of above and below as an example. So what happens is because this is of course a model, the actual atoms are much closer together. And so although it looks as though the p orbitals don't overlap above and below the plane, they have a side on overlap that is parallel to the interatomic axis. So the overlap of both lobes of the p orbital above and below the plane are taken together as one pi bond. Now to get up to a triple bond, we would need another bond and that is where if we look at our axis, we can have the p orbital existing in the plane in front and behind. And when they overlap side on, we can also form another pi bond. So the maximum we can form here is that one sigma bond in the middle and the two pi bonds around it. Drawing this as the molecular orbitals can make it easier to visualize. We have the gray sigma bond in the center and the pi bond would be these clouds above and below. Both of these represent the same kind of sigma bond and the same kind of pi bond. One is just using atomic orbitals and the second diagram using the molecular orbitals to explain it. So a single bond is quite simply equal to a sigma bond. A double bond is going to be one sigma bond and one pi bond and a triple bond will be one sigma and two pi bonds. So for a triple bond, we could add some red lines in just to show where those other interactions would be. So that second triple bond would just be the interactions between the p orbitals in front and behind the plane. Okay, so let's do quite a few questions on this so that we get the basic skills of identifying these things down. First question, how many sigma and how many pi bonds are there in O2? Pause the video and have a go. Pop them up. Here we have a simple double bond. Of course, a double bond is just going to be one sigma and one pi bond. That's it. Next question. How many sigma and how many pi bonds are there in N2? Pause the video to have a go. Pop them up. Of course here, now we just have a triple bond. Always got that one sigma bond in the middle, but now we have two pi bonds. Let's up the ante a bit. How many sigma and pi bonds are there in this molecule, butuanine? Pause the video to have a go. Pop them up. So with this molecule, I have 10 single bonds. So already I have 10 sigma bonds. Then I have one double bond and every double bond is obviously going to be one sigma bond and one pi bond. So in total, I'm going to have 11 sigma bonds and one pi bond. Something slightly different then. What is the hybridization of carbon A and carbon B in this molecule? Pause the video to have a go. Pop em up. So for carbon A, we have four bonds, zero lone pairs. So we know we're going to have a tetrahedral structure. Tetrahedral, we know must be sp3 hybridized. B has two bonds, one single and one triple bond. Now, every triple bond is one sigma and two pi bonds. So it has a linear shape, and the only way we can get linear is by having sp hybridized. Last quick question then, what is the hybridization of nitrogen in ammonia? Pause the video to have a go at that. 
pop them up. Well, we know with nitrogen, we've got three bonding pairs, one lone pair. That's four hybridized pairs in total, which is tetrahedral. So we must have sp3 hybridization. So this can take a fair bit of practice and it's fine if you're not getting it just yet. So here's some longer form questions that you can try now on the video. I'll do the answers in a moment to get a little bit more practice. Feel free to pause the video and have a go. So for question one, the reason is there is no available unhybridized p orbital to have the side on overlap required for a pi bond to form. So now going through each of the compounds down at the bottom, we have sp3. That's of course 109.5. The two carbons in the center are going to be sp hybridized for both of them with 180 degrees. And of course, we're going to have another sp3 with 109.5 on the other side. For the benzene, every single carbon in it is sp2 hybridized and has an angle of 120 degrees. We have sp2 with 120 degrees here. And on the end carbon, we have sp3, 109.5. Of course, the other carbon is the same as the one on the left. And then we have on the top molecule, sp3 at 109.5 for the carbon on the left. And the carbon on the right is sp2 with 120 degrees. So no practical to go with this video. But there are some questions to be done. Thanks again for joining me, guys. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share the video. You know the drill. Practice makes slightly better.